Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the Holy One, the Blessed One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Now, this, this sutta, the Chachaka Sutta, is a pet of mine. And I, there's not a big story behind this, but I had a stroke in my 40s that was induced by giving me the wrong medication when I had a breakdown. And part of the residual of that was the belief that I could never memorize anything ever again. It devastated me and I went through a lot with it. When I met Bhante, I related this to him. And when I was his copy for about four or five years, actually more than that, up until 2010, I was the primary person for transporting him and, and assisting him and getting him to retreats all over the world. And when I had to cross the country with him from New York to California, and then uh, we did this trip twice. The first year it was 18,600 miles of driving. And the second time it was 16,800 miles of driving, what was, which was really kind of funny on the odometer. But driving along, I question him about everything. And when you want to be, a, if you want to be a copy and take hold of that responsibility, you have the monk where you can ask questions when you're transporting him. <laughs> And so we got in this thing about constantly asking questions and he thought it was a payback because when he was with Usulananda in California, Venerable Usulananda, who is now the late most venerable Usulananda, in 2000, you know, in, in, uh, when Bhante came back and before he went to Asia, he was connected with Usulananda. And um, Usulananda said he's going to come back the smartest man that's ever been on the earth because he would never stop asking questions. So here he had this student, <laughs> me, and I was very precocious and would simply keep asking questions. And he persuaded me to believe uh, the second time we drove, the first year, he only sort of asked me to start memorizing parts of the Dhamma. And people say, well, how can I memorize the Dhamma memorize? Memorization is not just about suttas. It is about all the pieces that we use to teach you all of the, uh, the Pali and English translations. The, but, but not you don't have to learn Pali to start memorizing. I was actually a guinea pig, I think, for um, an experiment of his to see if you could teach an average American person the Buddhist uh, teachings in English. But when I went to many temples, I was very uncomfortable because I would hear a whole bunch of words in definitions that I didn't know. And I would hear the Pali words and then the general, um, just the general puja and some of the blessings, but you don't need a lot of that really. But what you do need is to know what everyone's talking about and hear the key words for the 37 requisites of enlightenment and the different parts. But then the next stage of memorization was to take the leap and try to memorize a sutta. So what was Bhante's position on the memorization of suttas? And he made it very clear to me that if we set up a program for people to do memorization of suttas, we needed to only be choosing suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya to begin with. And the reason was we rely on that as the whole teaching. The Majjhima Nikaya is known for that. The Samyutta Nikaya is a support system that agrees with the Majjhima Nikaya. But if you take the Majjhima Nikaya and start working with the primary suttas, so which suttas? The suttas that we are using persistently in our retreats are the suttas that we can consider they have what we need for information in order to get to the path and move down. And why is it so important to memorize? Well, because if you memorize something and you have it in your head and you keep doing it on a daily basis when you're learning to memorize it, and then um, when you need it, that information is there and you can draw out and you can present a case on the topics that are in that sutta. And Chichaka is very precious, very precious, because it holds the secret to one of the, uh, the, the biggest problems in teaching Buddhism, and that is self and no self, the atta, anatta. 
And the early linguists who were the first translators into English, many of them did not have teachers and they, they had teachers sometimes, but they didn't study, suddenly work with teachers. They were academic linguists and the linguists translated it and chose self and no self in English. So it can be very confusing in this day and time because, um, because of the emphasis on ego, because of Freud and ego and psychology and psychiatry using so much emphasis on, on Freud and, and so much emphasis on the importance of ego. And it's an interesting phenomenon because I'm, I'm in into it for so many years now and uh, the children have some of the best balanced egos I've ever seen and the people in, in the communities where I work have very well balanced egos, you know. And, um, but the fear has been so severe that some of the uh, books that have been written have said, please don't take your children to learn Buddhist meditation because they need to establish a strong ego. And it does, it's, it's because they don't understand what this was all about. So that's what this sutta is about. So I'm, I'm going to take it apart for you, but I'm also going to um, emphasize the pieces that I think are really important for you to remember in the first page. I, if you have the document, how I need to know, is there anybody here who doesn't have the document that I, that I sent out? Is anybody here that doesn't? Bunty, can you check on the chat for me or something? Does anybody not have the document? I'll send it on the chat. If they don't have, they will get it. Okay. Um, you see, I, I have a friend who writes with me. His name is Q. <laughs> He's the questioner. So when Q is persistently asking questions in what I write, I'm answering the questions. And um, this Hasuta, instead of, instead of revealing the usual philosophical angles of, of information about Buddhist practice involving hypothetical processes and mythical results and things like that, Q is asking me, are you saying that the Buddha actually found a very clear, succinct training program in the form of a drill that led a student to release themselves from suffering? And that if the student listened to this slowly and carefully, section by section, they, would, they were told the meanings of certain specific words. And, and then it was easy to understand, immediately effective, and very powerful. And I'm basically saying, yes, that's the thing about this sutta. It's marvelous. He, he put together the sutta in it, in it, we can see the formation of how he was teaching, precisely how he was teaching in his suttas. We hear the Four Noble Truths, for instance, as Westerners, we think, oh, that's the summation of Buddhism and that's all it is. But the Four Noble Truths, when we investigate further, was the actual path uh, the schematic, the plan for the for him to do his investigation. It was his his plan for investigation, his path, and then it was also his teaching method, and it was his his um, dissecting method. And then when he built his lessons and taught, uh, prepared his lessons to teach the monks. If you look at the suttas and examine them closely in the Majima Nikaya, most of the suttas are in the order of someone comes, they present a set of suffering, and then he, they present their point of view. And he, he tells them more clearly, succinctly what the suffering is and starts to talk about the cause of it. If they didn't, if they didn't see the cause of it clearly, and he takes them from the cause of it into um, understanding there can be a cessation of it. He doesn't always go to the four noble, uh, to the eightfold path, but it, so the patterns of the suttas are like, um, you know, suffering and, and cause and cessation or suffering and cessation or suffering and cause and cessation and path or cessation and path. And he keeps giving you the way, but he leaves certain things out for you to find. So that's something that we'll bump into this. But the suit is marvelous because he put this drill into one marvelous sutta and explains a terrific amount of things that were never understood by people. And um, 
it's not a suit to this is a trap it is not a suit to that you can pick up and just start working with if you do not have the foundation first we experimented with that and you have to have day one day two day three day four i think it's day five you have dependent origination and then the next night you have atta and nata in this sutta and by that time with that information practicing it in your daily practice, you really begin to understand what the sutta was about. Okay, so when I'm not going to go into the front, the first questions and stuff that, that uh, Q and I had the little conversation, you can read that yourself. I'm going to go into part two of this document. It has four parts. It has the first part with Q and I, and then the part two. This is the summary of the sutta. So if you were going to memorize the sutta, you would want to try to understand, read it through, and then try to break it down to see what's going on in the summer. This one is divine because it's not only explaining what the anatta and anatta is about, but it's showing them the, the problem with atta. And if anybody says that this is true, it's not, and here's why. And then the next section that we see after we, we see what we're going to be examining, the pieces we're going to be examining, the next section is going to, you can just see the monks sitting around him at listening to him talk about that. And then you can almost hear one of them asking the question, but how did that happen to us that we have that problem? And then he shows them exactly how they grew up having that problem of the Atta. And then in the third piece, they, another monk probably said something or he, you know, you could just imagine it. The, the question was there and he starts to answer the third question. If that's what happened, how do we get out of this? And so he shows them. And when he shows them the third part, if you know enough about the stories in the Majima Nikaya, about their daily routine and the monks, everything they did, how they spent their days going off and sitting by themselves and coming back and talking about the Dhamma at night, et cetera, and so forth. Um, you, you can see that he's giving them a drill. And Bhante's position on uh, teaching us was always teaching us directly from the suttas in, in Lesterville in the first location that we were at on the mountain. And um, so we, every night we're listening to a sutta and every day he's expecting us to carry out what it was we were taught and practice with it all day long while we're working in the forest, while we're clearing land, while we're building things, while we're you know cutting trees, clearing land, hauling rock, everything else. We're expected to be thinking constantly about what that lesson was the night before. And we'll go back with questions the next night if, if there we have questions. And we'll go into another sutta. And this is how we were trained, OK? So when we look at the framework of this sutta, we start at the beginning. He's identifying the six sets of six. And, and he's telling you the six internal bases, six external bases, six classes of consciousness, six classes of contact, six classes of feeling, and six classes of craving, OK? And the internal base is talking about the internal base of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, okay? And the external base of the sense door is the sense door object, the eye seeing a, a form, the ear, sound, nose, odor, tongue, flavor, body, sensation, and the mind, uh, mind objects. Then he does what's called the enumeration in the sutta. And the enumeration is breaking down each set clearly according to the sense doors, just as I showed you, demonstrating a sense door, the sense door object, and the sense door consciousness that come together to make contact happen, then feeling, then craving. So now we see the sutta coming uh, together, and it's going to take us from the sense door, the salyatana to the contact and then feeling and then craving. And that's as far as we're gonna go. We're not gonna go any more in the sutta. And so we see that it's really, it, you're gonna figure out that it's really about Atta and Anatta because we don't keep going through the whole, the whole line of dependent origination. But you needed dependent origination before 
you could understand what's going on here. And you'll see why. And the third part is the demonstration of not self. This is the one I said that the impersonal nature, the atta, anatta is the um, impersonal nature of everything. And he's, and, and so the first stage of the drill is to prove to yourself the impersonal nature of everything because it reveals there's something else, there's anatta. We do this by practicing the impersonal perspective throughout the drill. And it leads us to the realization of this impersonal nature of everything or seeing things, you're just seeing things as they actually are, that's all. Without me getting involved. It's like learning to live um, in the editing room of sort of the editing room of the filmmaker and you're, you get to see the film, but you never feel that you're actually in the play when you're observing. That's what witnessing is. And in this, uh, you can also kind of get a feel uh, for, the, um, for the fact that um, as an observer, you're just, not, you're just not there. He's trying to get you, he's trying to get you to see things as animals see the world. The animals see the world without the computing mind. Just see things as they are. They operate a lot on instinct. We can go to volition and make choices. The animals can't do that, but they operate. Um, they have a lot of communication, you know, lot, lots of communication that people sometimes, I, I think hear that people don't understand, but I've had discussions with people why people seem not to understand that dogs and cats and everything have feelings and can communicate. And they're very grateful if you try to help them. They're very grateful if you try to, uh, you know, give them food a certain time of day, just a little bit of food, because everybody on the street, we'd have fat dogs on this street, you know, because everybody's giving a tiny bit all the time to these animals every day. But they don't seem to have a relationship because they, with understanding communication between animals and people, simply because it's not a priority here. Survival is a priority. Having enough water, having enough food, helping your children grow up without scoliosis and rickets and malnutrition. That's the most important thing and animals come next. So here they haven't, it's not that they, they hate animals. That's a wrong impression or they don't care. They care first about their own survival and it's a very different world. So you have the demonstration of not self. The next piece is the origination of the identity. How does the false idea of everything, uh, that everything is personal or the Atta develop? As we're growing up, we take things personally by simply following uh, what we see others do. We watch people, what's happening around us. And then the next section is the cessation of identity. He shows them the way out. Like, this is what happened to you when you were growing up. This is how it happened. And you're walking around just saying it this way because everybody else around you is. And you can watch people and, and in an airport. I always go to the airport in the train station and where there's crowds and you're watching. If you just hang back under a tree someplace or sit down and watch. You can see the atta bursting out and you can see the craving happening right on the street. The cessation of identity. The second part of the drill is to, uh, is to practice seeing the lack of identity in all objects of the six sense doors. We begin to practice letting go of the personalization and we live with more harmonious, impersonal perspective towards everything. And if you're taking something impersonal, someone yells at you, you can approach the whole thing in a different way. So we teach you to forgive, the, forgive it right away and then enter with compassion to have some space to remember something. Remember that when somebody is angry and coming at you, they're not coming at you, they're coming at themselves. Probably, I don't know what the, what the statistics are on this. I never quite saw them, I don't think when, um, you know, in, in, in the social intercourse that occurs, actually, um, how many times everybody's taking stuff personally. I don't remember any figures like that, but it's there and you can watch it happening. And the, uh, 
that comes from a human need of needing to be heard. And it comes from a defensive position of everything's happening to me. And the, all these ideas are, are wiped away with Buddhism. You see, they're wiped away because nothing is happening to you in life. Everything is happening from you. And this is for you to discover as you're going through and how that works. Um, so the cessation of identity is where he really gives them that, that drill. And it's really great. You can see all these monks going out the next day and they take their bowls and they go get their food and they come back. <laughs> and then all day long, they're walking around with, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. With what they see, with what they hear, they smell, they taste, they sit and touch, they everything all day long and nobody's interrupting them. And they try to take it across the whole space all day long. It's the monks without the sunglasses and the radios and everything else that are doing this in the forest. You know, I'm teasing you. But, but um, the, everybody's doing it at just different rates of time in different places. Let's be fair with this, okay? Now, the underlying tendencies, this is where the meaty part gets. Section, uh, and this is actually, we made a mistake on this. I see that there's nine, there's actually eight sections to this thing. Um, the underlying tendency section is where we look at, it demonstrates what happens if we don't understand how things work and how we accidentally slip into Atta perspective without having correct knowledge. When we're not taught about the difference in this, we're cursed. I mean, we're stuck with falling into the Atta position. The Buddha shows us how we get into trouble if we don't understand clearly how feeling originates and how it disappears. So the rising and falling, rising and falling that is mentioned in the text, what it refers to is the origination and the disappearance of phenomena. Phenomena means phenomena. The eye is involved with the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body in any way or the mind. And we get into mental proliferation about it, which is mental proliferation and clinging upadana, same thing, okay? And the severe part of it where it really gets rolling, papancha, that's the name. And it's like you're punched in the stomach. So, you know, it's why I love that name, papancha. So how it disappears, uh, and then we get, how we get caught up in the personal gratification of it. That's what gratification means when you hear it in the sutta. It means personally involved or person, not just personally pleased, but personally having aversion or personally wanting attachment either way to it. And the danger of getting caught in this, what does it mean the danger of getting caught? Why does it say, and the danger of it? It says the danger of the gratification is that you are pulled out of the present time. You're not in the present time. And all of that gratification, that personal involvement is coming from the past or from the future worries or past regrets. And that's the shortest way for me to say it. Okay. Um, and then the next one is the escape. And it's, it's a thrill to hear that the fifth piece that's in this line of things, the origination, disappearance, gratification, danger, and the escape from the suffering, this, this causes us, okay. So just by that sitting in that sutta is really nice to see. I found the escape. He's saying, this is the escape, okay. The escape is practicing to turn it around from taking everything personally to everything impersonally and start to act like the scientist more, like the scientist who's examining, investigating, just to see how everything works without judgment, without condemnation, without assumption. This is a big problem with communication. When you say something or start to investigate something or talk about something, sometimes people get very upset uh, about what you say. But if you look closely, it's like in this day and time, the listener doesn't have much responsibility at all. Everything's on what the person may have said and the listener 
just can compute it any way they want. They haven't been taught that they should impersonally listen to what someone says because you don't know the person, especially on the internet, because you don't know the person, you don't see the person, we see you now, but usually we didn't see you at all for seven or eight years when I was working on the original um, support group for Damasuka. And so if somebody gets upset, I used to contact them privately and try to figure out what was really going on. Uh, but it was hard in the group because someone would get in there and say, what do you mean by that? Why are you talking like that? What are you saying? And before they learned what you were saying, and I couldn't understand it. And part of it is, I'll, I'll confess something to you. When I was six years or seven years in Washington, D.C., I hung out with a bunch of people who were in think tanks think tanks, the Brookings think tank, this think tank, that think tank. And think tank people are not like normal people. You know, they're not. I could go visit Perel and find out what she's working on and go to her door and I could just, you know, just stomp on her project and tell her every reason it isn't going to work and criticize it and everything else. And then afterwards, afterwards, she would probably come to my door and she would just stomp on me and what I'm doing and tell me all the reasons my project wouldn't work and tear me apart. And then probably we'd meet at lunch and say, how's it going? <laughs> and and there, there was never anybody taking anything personal. And the downfall for me, the downfall was after five or six years of this. And it was my first time really having time in my life to socialize with people. And then I went out in the world and other people you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do critical analysis. They think they're, that you're criticizing somebody instead of just critical analysis for the sake of seeing how something works. And they come right at you. And I'm supposed to figure out what those people are going to think so I can no longer ever brainstorm. Remember that. And in the United States, I ran a company for personnel placement. And it got real interesting because all in Bechtel and B&W and big companies, all they were having problems all of a sudden. Human resources was having a problem because in six people, you know, in a group normally would brainstorm on a project and just say things off the top of their head and write it down on the board. Now you had to sit there and you didn't know who was in the room on the team and you better watch out what you say. And so what happened is brainstorming collapsed in the United States, it did. And then people were getting laid off until we can figure out the person understands what you were really saying. You can get laid off with pay. Happened to a friend of mine, said the wrong thing about a tennis match. I mean, it was crazy. And I, I, you know, I it didn't realize when it happened. This is why we have to be careful on the internet. And this is what this is talking about in this section is really looking at examining things to see this is what the Buddha was after, without any criticism, without any judgment, without anything, just understanding what he's saying, and then running the drill as hard as you can to see what happens. Okay. So now part three of this, okay, okay, I'm sorry. We had the underlying tendencies, the first section. This is what's so neat about this, if you want to memorize something, because you have these eight sections and number the summary, the enumeration, and the uh, the de up to the demonstration of not so The front part of it, the front part of the suit is nothing to memorize. It's just a little bit of a list. Then after you announce those six pieces of everything, the enumeration, um, is hooking it together, eyes and forms, ears, and, and we all know that stuff, and that one's short. Demonstration of not self is the declaration. If anyone says that, uh, if anyone says the, um, if anyone says the eyes are uh, self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the eyes is seen and understood, and since it's rise and fall are are uh, understood since its rise and fall occur and it's understood, it would, it would mean that when it fades away, I fade away. And since that's not true, therefore I am not the I, the I is not me. And this is very basic, but he had to drum it from the, he was, he was 
dissecting this thing and taking it down to make you work very closely with it. And he takes you through the eye and the forms and the eye consciousness and the eye contact and the eye feeling and the eye craving. In all cases, you know, they are not me, they are not mine, they are not myself. But when you grew up, you thought this is me, this is mine and it is myself. And the danger of that, that um, what did they say? Delusion, that delusion was that then what happens? You gotta go see Perel because you're blaming yourself. You're gonna have anxiety, your stress is gonna go up and then you're gonna fall into a depression and look at what's happening. That's real, that's real. That's the steps of what's happening. So when we turn this around, if you keep training the brain and in this, when I'm talking to you, how do you turn, uh, train the brain? It's important to understand this. Neurologically, this is proved now. And they look at the, uh, you know, they look at this new subject matter of neuroplasticity, but um, the neuroplasticity goes further than that. And all of a sudden it involved behavioral modification therapists coming and doing the research again with the knowledge of how do we make new neural pathways in our brain? What happens to them is probably, I'm not sure on this Perel, but I think it's 10 or 15 years ago, they still believed those neural pathways, once they develop, you're stuck with them, honey, and you can't change them. And that was where the expression, he can never change, she can never change came from. Because this was promoted. Once you're an adult, you're stuck, but you're not, you're not stuck. And the biggest deal about this neuroplasticity that some of them don't talk about it much, but I think it's magnificent is in mental health. All of a sudden this big door opened and there was a great big sign in bubble letters on the wall. Hope is here. Hope for what? Hope for change. And how do we change? So when you go and you look in, uh, you go where they have the talks, YouTube, and you go in the search engine and you look up, you have to, don't just look up neuroplasticity. <laughs> Please don't do that. That's not the subject. It is how do we make new neural pathways how to produce new neural pathways in our brain and change behavioral patterns. That's the research you want to look up. Get it again, okay? How do we, how, how do I change, try this one. How do I change a habit when I'm over 25? And uh, that's another topic. But if you wanna go to the neural pathways, you say, how do we develop the development of new neural pathways and the connection with the changes in behavioral patterns. That's where you go for this research. And it's gonna be fun because you know what you're gonna find? You're gonna find right effort. <laughs> That's what you're gonna find. When you read the instructions of what you have to do to change the brain, you're gonna find right effort. You need to recognize the difference from um, how we say, un mm. careful behavior and careless behavior, careful use of the brain and careless use of the brain, okay? And so that's how you figure out unwholesome is it's, uh, the human being's not gonna operate well. Cause I'm not gonna point to somebody like, I'm not gonna point to Linda Tay and say, you're thinking unwholesome thoughts. Because, you know, she might walk away and she might say, she thinks I'm unwholesome. I'm not coming back here. <laughs> you see what happens? So we have to be careful in some respects, the words we use, I think. But careless and careful is one of the terminologies in the Samyutta Nikaya for what to do about a hindrance. In the section I tell you, page 1597 of the Samyutta Nikaya by Bhikkhu Bodhi, there's a discussion that goes on. And it has to do with the connection between the hindrances and the arising or non-arising of the enlightenment, of uh, the enlightenment fact, direct enlightenment factors, okay? And they have to arise in order for you to be able to fall into cessation, get through and experience Nibbana. 
you, they have to arise, but they can't arise until you solve the issue of the hindrances. That's why we've been spending all our time with all the suttas we've been doing to keep in our mind, whatever we're talking about, how is this in relationship to the hindrance? I've been trying to pull out the various uh, suttas for you to see what the Buddha had to say about this. And it's wondrous. The sutta doesn't have any information. Leave it alone and it will go home. Don't engage it. Abandon it is universal through the, through the whole thing. Whenever they come up, just abandon them, recognize them as an imperfection and let them go, abandon them. So his pronouncement on these hindrances was always when they get in your way to uh, release them, relinquish them, abandon them let them go, let them be because of Anicca, because he taught Anicca, whatever arises always passes away. And whatever originates, then it uh, originates and then it, it, it uh, passes away. And when that happens, that's the demonstration for you of Anicca, okay? So coming back to this, and then you had the uh, demonstration of not self. You had the origination of it. How did we get it? The cessation of it. How do we let it go? And he tells you these two next sections are the largest sections in in the in the um, um, in the sutta, but they're easy for you to learn <laughs> because you're learning. The repetition is what makes them so easy, and. The, once you learn to do the underlying tendency section uh, for that shows you how you it's impossible for you to get to Nibbana, then what happens is he gives you the abandonment of the underlying tendencies. And guess what? It's the same exact paragraph, but instead of their um, being lust, there is not lust and there is not aversion and so forth and so on. So you'll hear it in a minute when we do it, the part of it. After that, the last part of it gets very exciting. By the time you have reading through six times the underlying tendencies and six times the abandonment of the underlying tendencies, your brain is really ready to hear the liberation section. And the liberation section explains that as we become enlightened in this way, our perspective shifts. And as we let go and get out of the way, mind opens up fully, allowing us to experience a natural and wholesome shift in our personality. It's very natural. The brain does it, your, your mind does it. You're not having to work or work on it all the time. In fact, if you wanna be liberated and you wanna reach Nibbana, you sit down expecting nothing, just to see what happens next in every one of your sittings and don't do anything. There was an expression that came up once about effortless effort. And um, it was something in re regards to another practice, some part of it, but this is truly, that's a key note, effortless effort. You make all, you fall into the stream in your mind and it keeps, starts moving in the direction and it's pull, after a while, you know it's moving inside you. Um, I've told people if you quit and you go away a couple of months, you come back and then start meditating again, how is it that you can be right there where you were before and maybe even ahead of it when you come back? How can that happen? When I'm keeping journals on people, how did that happen to me? They'll say, because you opened up something inside yourself that's in there naturally. And I think this is what some traditions will refer to as Buddha nature. The Buddha nature is in everyone. The way I say to you, all of us are born with four seeds inside of us in regards to the Brahma Viharas. We have a seed for the Metta, the Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. We just never did any care of the garden. <laughs> That's all. And you, it's inside each one of us, everybody. It was even inside Angulimala. And it finally cultivated, the Buddha started to show him how to cultivate that. And then it started to open up. You see, we become disenchanted uh, with the old way of the way that means disenchanted with the old way that we were seeing things, letting go of past concerns, allowing dispassion to arise, uh, which contains a, a great balance and equanimity. Now, any time 
you are talking about disenchantment, you are talking about dispassion, you are talking about the balance and equanimity. Anytime you're talking about developing these, nothing is cut and dry. It's not, it's like there's, um, there is, there was, um, I can't remember an older tradition. There was a very old tradition that said equanimity. It only happens in the fourth jhana, bang. It's not exactly true. I started testing this and examining it. And you'll see me when I do my boards. And uh, I had a very exciting thing happen this week. We got a four foot by six foot whiteboard. We're really excited, except it doesn't have a um, the frame for it yet. We have to go back and get them to deliver the frame so I can move it around. And it's actually a flip so I can do one and not destroy it and turn it over and do another. When I start doing the whiteboards, oh my, <laughs> it gets very fun, you know? And um, so when you're working with this, you get, you get to feel this liberation part at the end because your mind is just ready to hear it. And your whole body is just waiting. Like, you know, this is something that probably is real. You still have to go out and check it. You have to go out and sit with it. Okay, part three. Part three, I'm giving you the connection for Bonte's reading that was done on Easter 2016. And I'm giving you also the reading that I did that was from Ruth Dennison's Vipassana Center in Joshua Tree. And that was way back. I can't remember which year. But in the front of that, there's a capsule of what we're doing right now, where I explain the sutta before I start reciting it. Okay, and actually in that case, I had the, I was reading most, I wasn't really reading that much, but I was reading some. And you follow along using the four part, um, part in part four now, what you do is you, you turn these, uh, one of these on and you, then have the whole entire suit. I gave you the whole entire suit to print out and it was laid out in large print for a reason. And what we did with them when we were working with them, I, I didn't get to do this originally. I had to do it in the truck with Bonte, driving six hours or seven hours a day. And once we started working on this, the second year I was driving, we would get up at very early, sit. Then we would, I would get him into the car to go get breakfast at seven and then uh, into the truck and um, and when, as soon as we had about an hour for breakfast, and then as soon as we started driving, we drove till eleven, and the whole time we were we were doing this, and he and I were doing it together, and um, we kept each other going, and it was fun. It was really fun. But I realized over the years working with other people, trying to help them to get started and how to do this, that. It's one of the easiest suttas. It's much easier. It's easier than 111 because 111 has a variation in each level. So the levels are not repeated. There's different variations that you go through. Okay, so now we get to the sutta and we listen for a while with the recording and follow it here on the, on the paper. And then we just do it we start to do it without the recording. And you should be able, if you're reading this, you should be able to get through it in one hour. And that's comfortable, comfortable reading. It's not pushed. That's comfortable enough for you to have it going in your head. It's about 57 to 60 minutes long. So when you see this in the front part, he sets them up. And what exactly is he telling the monks that he's doing? And the, the statement in verse two, students, I shall teach you the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end with the right meaning and phrasing. I shall reveal a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. And that is the six sets of six. He's basically telling them that this is going is the purpose of your, your holy life. This is the how to get to the objective, the main objective, which is experiencing Nibbana. And then they say, uh, listen closely. He says, listen closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable, the students replied, the blessed ones said this. Now, this is what I mean about the synopsis. Here's one whole section. 
The six internal bases should be understood. The six external bases should be understood. The six classes of consciousness should be understood. The six classes of contact should be understood. The six classes of feeling should be understood. The six classes of craving should be understood. That's the end of the synopsis. Okay, that's one whole section. Now the enumeration has six parts in it. So it goes on for a while, but just watch how it starts and then you'll understand how it compounds and rolls over beyond that part to get longer like that, like that with each one. The six internal bases should be understood. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the eye base, the ear base, the nose base, the tongue base, the body base, and the mind base. So it was in reference to this, that it was said that the six internal bases should be understood. And this is the first set of six. That's the first section of this. The next one is the second section. The six external bases should be understood. So now you see what he's doing. The six, the internal base, now the external base. The external bases should be understood. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said, there is the form base, the sound base, the odor base, the flavor base, the tangible base, and the mind object base. So it was in reference to this that it was said the six and external bases should be understood. And this is the second set of six. Now watch, we add a little bit to it. The six classes of consciousness should be understood. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, now watch, dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. That's the new declaration. That's the new information. So then it happens dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. Dependent on the nose and odors, nose consciousness arises. Dependent on the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. Dependent on the body and tangibles, body consciousness arises. Dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. So it was in reference to this that it was said the six classes of consciousness should be understood. And this is the third set of six. And then it goes, the six classes of contact should be understood. So it was said, with reference to what was this said, dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. Again, now they set you up, the eye and the forms, eye consciousness. And then, I'm sorry, the meeting of the three is eye contact. So that's the new set now. That's the new setup. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises, the meeting of the three is ear contact and so forth through the whole list again. When you get to five, you have, that's the fourth one, right? That's the fourth one, five. The six classes of feeling should be understood. Now we roll it over one little tiny bit more. And with reference to what was this said, dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is eye contact. With eye contact is condition, eye feeling. That's what happens. So now you have the next, that's the next piece. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises with the meaning of the three. There is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. So we go through all the six pieces that with that set. The sixth piece is the six classes of craving should be understood. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, Dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises and the meeting of the three is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, there is eye feeling. With eye feeling as condition, there is eye craving. So that's the new set. Dependent on the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is ear contact. With ear contact as condition, there is ear feeling. With ear feeling as condition, there is ear craving, okay? That's what that one is. That takes you through the setup. Now you get the demonstration of not self. And this is where they're gonna hear for the, could be for the first time that they're listening. If anyone says the I is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood. And since it's rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the I is self and thus the I is not self. How did I prove it? Well, I proved it because my I, it will work 
and then it doesn't work, but I'm still here. Okay, and then it goes to the forms. It does the same paragraph is done again. If anyone says forms ourself, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of forms is seen and understood. And since it's rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say forms are self. And thus the eye is not self. So when you open your eye, you see a form. And when you're in contact with that, when that you're paying attention to that form, that's when you see it. If you move away, you're not seeing the form, but I'm still here. Am I still here? I'm still here. That's it. And then if anyone says I consciousness is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of I consciousness is seen and understood. And since it's rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say that the consciousness, I consciousness is self. Thus the I is not self, the forms are not self, and the I consciousness is not self. So now at the end, they keep reiterating it. The I is not self, then the I is, and the I is uh, not self, the forms are not self, the I is not self, the forms are not self, the I consciousness is not self. You have the same paragraph that ends with the I is not self, the forms are not self, I consciousness is not self, and I contact is not self. Contact happens, it happens very fast and it's over, but I'm still here. You see, I'm still here. And he's making them look at this minute example, this explanation of anatta. Now he's teaching them, but you're still here. So how could you be that? And therefore, how could it be what's coming? <laughs> and you'll see what comes next. The, in the I, the next one is I feeling is self. And it goes through to the end. I is not self. Forms are not self. I consciousness is not self. I contact is not self. And I feeling is not self. It's just a feeling. And when it's finished and moves on to, to the craving, then you personally get involved with it. And it heats up. If anyone says I craving is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of I craving is seen and understood. And since it's rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say that I craving is self. And thus the I is not self. Forms are not self. I consciousness is not self. I contact is not self. Um, I feeling is not self and I craving is not self. Now, I just did the I, and there were six sections to that because you're getting, by the time you're finished learning this, you're really going to understand the sense door, the sense door object, and the consciousness makes the contact happen. Then the feeling comes up, and then the craving. You're really going to understand this. And this is the, the meat of the teaching. You have to understand how this operates. The next one is the ear. It's the same exact section. You go through all these pages and then it's the nose and then it's the tongue and then it is the body and then it is the mind. And it's very interesting about this, isn't it? Very interesting because in our own science in the development of our history of science, I don't think we really understood that the mind is operating exactly the same way as the eyes and ears and nose and tongue and body. But the Buddha knew that, and it was included in his teachings. And this becomes a vitally interesting part with mental health, how this works. And um, it's really fascinating how all this ties together. So now they've been told that this, this is a, a fact that these are not yours. And they might even be a monk sitting there who's going to argue with them. Because I've had students say, but what I see is mine. It's my site and I own it. And usually I just tell them, okay, here's my phone number. <laughs> and they say, what do you mean? You call me in the morning when you wake up. And when you... you you call me because you tell me that you told your eye what to see when you open your eye and it worked. And nobody's ever called me. I don't know why, <laughs> because then later they come to me and they say, you know, that's, that's true. That's not, that's not right. It's, that's right. So it's not your eye. It, it's a part of this container 
okay, this body, but it's not your eye, except in the conventional reality, we say it's my eye, my eye hurts, and I expect you to keep, even if you become an arahat, I don't expect you to walk in and try to attempt to have a conversation with me without any pronouns. It's the silliest thing I've ever heard, you know, and you can't be enlightened or know anything if you're not speaking without any pronouns, try, try writing for one week, everything you do without using any pronouns at all. Just try it. The next one is the origination of the identity. And, the, and I told you, this is the part where some student says, but, but what happened to us? I mean, you know, how did we get that way? So he's demonstrated if any this person is going to show up and tell you this is true, and you you know it's not true, you can sense he's telling you the truth, but they want to know if that's the problem, how did it happen? And then he tells them the origination of this identity problem. He says, now students, this is the way leading to the origination of identity. One regards the I thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards forms thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards I consciousness thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And one regards I contact thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And one regards I feeling thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And one regards I craving, thus, uh, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And then one regards the ear in the same way, and the nose in the same way, and the tongue in the same way, and the body in the same way, and the mind in the same way. And if you say that the same way to people when you're teaching them, they won't learn anything at all. <laughs> You know, I've had people say, I just tell them, you know, I, you didn't tell them anything. Because if they just listen intently to this sutta and it comes inside of you and you start to listen, go through the experience he's taking you through, at the end of it, there's nothing left but consciousness. And that won't happen if you play the ditto mark game. It just doesn't happen. So the next, they, they realize that he's saying, let's do it again. One regards the mind thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards mind objects thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards mind consciousness thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards mind contact thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. One regards mind feeling thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. And one regards mind craving thus, this is mine, this I am, this is myself. So there's the delusion. Now he's going to tell them, this is the way out. You have to teach yourself to learn how to let go and you have to use the contradiction and retrain the brain how do you train a brain we've touched this before ping 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 and pretty soon they're going to say my name is ping <laughs> this is what happens okay <laughs> because the military learned this in World War II. They didn't do so much of it in World War I, but brainwashing and the born identity is a real problem. That was a real program. I don't know if you looked or knew about that, but it really was. The born identity was a real thing. And how did they brainwash him to believe that? We don't need to brainwash you very far. We're just going to take you a little bit of the way to let go of all the things that are causing you suffering and step back into what operates smoothly for your life. Nevertheless, this is a brain and how you do it. And in the research, it's pointing it out like crazy now. In order to do it, the reason you can change a habit and teach an old dog new tricks 
How can you do that? You can teach that old dog new tricks with patience and doing it the same way every single time. And you can't ring a different bell or blow a different whistle. And we're talking Pavlov's dog here when we go back to the discussion of Pavlov's dog. You was where um, they, uh, what they, they rang a bell, I think, and the dog salivated for his food. So he, he you know, ring the bell, sal the food is coming. That's how not, that's not it works. I can go outside right now with these dogs when I give them something in the morning and I can just go and they come right around the corner. <laughs> it only took two days and they knew that I was going to give them some puppy food. Okay, now this one is really great. This is the cessation of identity and they're going to, he's going to give the monks a drill. It's up to them what they do with it. But you can see them walking around for the whole day. Now, students, this is the way leading to the cessation of identity. You retrain your brain. <laughs> One regards the I thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. One regards forms thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. One regards I consciousness thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards eye contact thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards I feeling thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards I craving thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. One regards the ear thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Every time you hear a bird, every time you hear anything, it is not you, it is not mine, it is not myself. You're repeating it throughout. And you, when, when you're saying the ear, you're also saying, I understand it goes deeper than that. It goes the sound, the ear, the sound, the consciousness, the contact, the feeling, and so forth. See, all the way to craving. So you're training it, and you're, it's a dogmatic way of training the brain. But if you do this, then you get to the next section. The underlying tendencies showing how suffering happens. This shows you how suffering happens. It also shows you how at the bottom of each one of these sections, it's going to say, this is impossible because the underlying tendencies, if they are there, it is impossible for you to take and everything impersonally and let go, which is adopting the anatta, the anatta instead of atta. Students dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is eye contact. With contact as condition, there arises an eye feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant. When one is touched by a pleasant eye feeling, if one delights in it, welcomes it and remains holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust lies within one. When one is touched by a painful eye feeling, if one sorrows, grieves and laments, weeps beating one's breast and becomes distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion lies within one. When one is touched by a neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling, if one does not understand as it actually is, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger and the escape in regards to that I feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance lies within one. Students that one shall here and now make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for pleasant I feeling without abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards a painful eye feeling, without extirpating the underlying tendency 
to ignorance in regards to a neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling without abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is impossible. Let's go back a little bit into this. First of all, um, when it's a pleasant feeling, there is, there is a, this touches the slippages that I studied. <laughs> okay, the slippages. So let's talk about slippages or when something's been changed in Buddhism really messes the person up because they, as a Buddhist, for instance, think they are not allowed to smile or they are not allowed to enjoy smelling a rose. They are not permitted to appreciate the smell of jasmine or anything like that anymore. And it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Okay, And there's no problem with this until you get to clinging and you get to um, an over amount of desire, lust and that sort of thing. And the idea is, oh, but if we touch any at all, we can't have, you know, lust is where you're wanting and you're gonna move to clinging, okay. But the experience itself, if you have adopted the anatta perspective, certainly you can see and hear and smell and taste and touch, but you cannot cling to it. So what does it say? When a person touches by a pleasant feeling, if one ready, delights in it, welcomes it and remains holding to it, there's your key. Then the underlying tendency to lust, the damaging lust lies within one. There's the key, okay? Delights in it, welcomes it and remains holding to it. So. When John comes home in the military from Vietnam and he gets home to his mom, mom's not allowed to be delighted and welcome him and, you know, full of love and energy and just thrilled that he's home and he's alive. No, come on. This is so, so silly. Come on. It's not supposed to be dehumanizing this thing. It's not supposed to be dehumanizing. So when you don't understand this, you live in a condo in, with everybody else around you in a row house, but you don't cut your grass because you don't want to cut the blades of grass, but you're a five preceptor and you can cut the grass. This is okay. <laughs> and you don't want to clean your garden up or sweep your walk. I, I, this, is, this is very hard to understand how people go this far, but it's because nobody's explaining it. So here, let's try again. When one is touched by a painful eye feeling, if one sorrows, grieves, and laments, weeps, beating one's breast, and becomes distraught. Well, that's pretty clear. That was my teenage years. <laughs> Sorrow, grieving, lamenting, weeping, and beating one's breast, and becoming distraught because I had to clean my room instead of go to the mall. <laughs> You know, and then the underlying tendency to aversion lies within one. Well, aversion, it has to do with equanimity and you just do whatever you have to do to keep peace. And I was explaining to a young girl and her mother about this very situation of she didn't want to clean her room because her friends were waiting and the grandmother was coming to visit and she wanted to go to the mall and the mother just wanted a little help to clean the house. And I said, look, what we need here is, um, what do you call that where you agree to do it together? It's a, it's a, uh, I can't remember this. You can't, they make a deal here, you know, help her clean her room for five minutes, the two of you. And you help her clean the kitchen for five minutes and then you go and mom, grandma comes to visit and that's the end of it. And she said, but why? I said, because it's a very much an Anicca thing. You see, there's always this confrontation with your mother. It's just a very Anicca thing. It's gonna be rise, be here and pass away. So let it go, let it go and make a deal and help each other. And then if you both are happy and your friends and I know you love your mom and your mom loves you. And then they did it and they were laughing about it. The next day they came back and wanted more. Okay, when one is touched by a neither pleasant nor painful eye feeling, if one does not understand as it actually is, and here are the five pieces you need to know about with your investigation. How does the phenomena in the six sense doors, your, the way you experience life, 
how does it originate? That's dependent origination, how it absolutely works. And then how does it disappear? How does it arise and then pass away? And then the gratification, how do I get personally involved in it? And what's the danger of it? The danger of it is if you get personally involved and stick with Atta, huh, you're not going to be in the present time anymore, <laughs> not very much, because you're going to be all wrapped up in what I, me, my, and mine are, have, needing, wanting, everything, demanding. And the escape is simple. It's just to let it go, to remember Anicca, whatever is here is arising, it's here now, it's gonna pass away, fine. It's not permanent. So can we deal with it? Sure, we can. And what's our escape? Quick escape, six Rs, use your six Rs. You see the unwholesome nature of it and you don't wanna deal with it. So you just let go of the personal feelings and you, you, you clean it up or you do what has to be done or you correct the person and go on, that's all. In regards to what is going on. And then it goes a little bit for that one shall here and now, let's see, make an end of suffering without abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for a pleasant eye feeling, without abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards a painful feeling. Now, abolishing and um, let's see, uh, abandoning sounds nice. Abolishing sounds like work. And the tendency today is when we see any words in English that look like they mean hard work, we're going to choose the hard work. But you can abolish something if you have the instructions and you know how it works where the other person can't. So let them push and pull and punch and go everywhere, which way to get it done. But you, if you understand how it works, that whatever's happening just is arising and now it's here and then it's gonna go away. And so we just let it be and it'll pass. And you do what needs to be done. You don't sit there and cry or you don't sit there and frown and complain. You just understand that a Nietzsche is always real. No matter how bad the situation is, how deep the water is in your bedroom when the washer <laughs> <laughs> when the washer leaks, you just simply get it done, you know, on the wooden floor that was snapped together that needs to stay dry. <laughs> this is a great adventure. Okay. Without abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful eye feeling, without extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance. Now, what does it mean to extirpate something? How do you know? And I, I, we used to laugh about this word to extirpate. And we were in California, we were in a bookstore and David was, <laughs> David was there, Bunty was there. We're all running around in different sections of the bookstore. And David went to get a cup of coffee. He was sitting at a table and he was looking at a book he was thinking about buying. And there were a group of women standing there in a coffee clutch. And, and the one woman said to the other, well, I've got, we didn't think it was a real word. Okay. And the one says to the other one, I got to go now. I have to extirpate my garden. Extirpate her garden. And that's what David said, extirpate the garden. And she said, that's a perfectly good word. What are you criticizing my word? <laughs> and he said, no, it's just that. And then he explained, we see it coming up with Bhikkhu Bodhi in this wonderful sutta that we can basically understand until we get to the word extirpating. And it's not a common vocabulary word. It means to remove something, including the roots. So when you're weeding the garden, it's a perfect word to use <clears throat> for, for uh, weeding the garden. It's just great, you know, without extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regards to an either pleasant or painful eye feeling. And you just let these feelings go and you just learn to go past them. These are neither pleasant nor painful eye feelings without abandoning ignorance. You have to abandon not knowing everything. So every time you come to visit me or any of the teachers or guides that are out there talking about TWIM, we're trying to give you the opposite of ignorance. We're trying to give you knowledge, arousing the true knowledge 
and then you can go to Nibbana. So this was the section I'm talking about, the underlying tendencies showing how suffering happens. And this was the, the big one. Now, this section, once you say this one six times, <laughs> you know it, you know, basically, you know it. And you can underline a piece that you don't until you get it, but you will get it very quickly, very quickly, because it came from all the other stuff that you were saying before. And now this section is here and you'll be able to pick it up. And of course, the bonus is you get to say it six times, okay? So when you say that one six times, then you get to the next section, abandonment of the underlying tendencies is how suffering doesn't happen and you get to Nibbana. I should probably have written and you get to Nibbana because in this one, you listen to the opposite of what they're doing in the other one, but it's the same paragraph. It's not changed with other material. So let's do it with the, um, let's see. We'll do it with the mind. Okay, this time we will go over to the last one and we'll do the mind. Students dependent on the mind and mind objects, mind consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is mind contact. With mind contact as condition, there arises a mind feeling felt as pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful. When one is touched by a pleasant mind feeling, if one does not delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it, then the underlying tendency to lust does not lie within one. When one is touched by a painful mind feeling, if one does not sorrow, grieve and lament, does not weep beating one's breast and become distraught, then the underlying tendency to aversion does not lie within one. When one is touched by a neither pleasant nor painful mind feeling, if one understands as it actually is, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape, in regard to that mind feeling, then the underlying tendency to ignorance does not lie within one. Students that one shall here and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to lust for a pleasant mind feeling, by abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion for painful mind feeling, by extirpating the underlying tendency to ignorance in regards to neither pleasant nor painful mind feeling, by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, this is possible. So in these six sections, he's saying this makes it possible for you to go through and experience Nibbana. Then we fall into the last section, which is the real thrill. I mean, it just makes you shiver, you know, when you've read this whole thing, your body and your mind are ready for you to read the last section and notice the liberation of mind begins to happen as you're reading the liberation section. Seeing thus students, a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with the eye, disenchanted with forms, disenchanted with eye consciousness, disenchanted with eye contact, disenchanted with eye feeling and disenchanted with eye craving. He becomes disenchanted with the ear, disenchanted with sounds, disenchanted with ear consciousness, disenchanted with ear contact, disenchanted with ear feeling, disenchanted with ear craving. He becomes disenchanted with the nose, disenchanted with odors, disenchanted with nose consciousness, disenchanted with nose contact, disenchanted with nose feeling, disenchanted with nose craving. He becomes disenchanted with the tongue, disenchanted with flavors, disenchanted with tongue consciousness, disenchanted with tongue contact, disenchanted with tongue feeling, disenchanted with tongue craving. He becomes disenchanted with the body, disenchanted with tangibles, 
disenchanted with body consciousness, disenchanted with body contact, disenchanted with body feeling, disenchanted with body craving. He becomes disenchanted with the mind, disenchanted with mind objects, disenchanted with eye con mind consciousness, disenchanted with mind contact, disenchanted with mind feeling, disenchanted with mind craving. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. And through dispassion, mind is liberated. And when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge. It is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. And what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Now, we like, I like this the last statement because we take the link bawa in if you haven't heard the link bawa the history on it before it's maybe hard to understand but we call it being you know um and what first of all we don't well we don't say being we say habitual tendencies for em habitual emotional tendencies or habitual tendencies, either way that it's written on the dependent origination chart. Now, the um, when it says what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. These habitual tendencies for reaction, for emotional reaction, there's no more. They're just not there. They're not part of life. If they happen in a freak thing, it's like you're there, oops, okay, forgive me, but you know, it's nothing driving force anymore. There's no habitual anger issues or um, anxiety or jealousy or resentment or things like that coming up really fast in the form of a reaction anymore. It doesn't happen. And so that's what he's talking about. Birth is destroyed. The birth, you can look at this now. Remember, all these things they talk about when you're talking about this as lifetimes, the actual birth will not happen again, is what they're saying. When you go through the super mundane level of arahat and fruition, there is no more coming to any state of being. The arahat is dismantled. How do we mean? And Bhante likes to tell the story of the sand castle on the seashore where the tides come up and you build this remarkable English castle. And I've done that as a kid when my uncle and I used to build these big castles and everybody would come on the beach and get involved with flags. And we had everything inside shells that were representing knights and different kind of shell that was representing the nuns and the priests and just everything inside the temple and the horses and everything. And then the tide came up. <laughs> <laughs> when the tide comes up and takes away a sandcastle, it is absolutely positively and just notably not a discussion. You can never put this thing back together again, it's exactly the way it was. It's a one-time shot, you know, one-time deal. So you can't put the person back together again, ever, ever, ever. They can't come back in the form of a human being ever again. It's not possible or any kind of being for that matter. So that's the true liberation in the supreme uh, Nibbana, super mundane form of Nibbana. And these, mun these super mundane Nibbanas are happening uh, is what, now this is the, the contention of um, Bhante that these things are happening. I, I just did a chart today, or I guess it was this morning. I woke up out of a sound sleep and just went and started doing this chart really fast from some to some, some of the uh, retreats we did and, and 2019, 2020. And uh, nobody gets to go to Nibbana if they're not sitting at about three hours. That's the turning point. Three hours is the flip point. And after you've done it once in a say soda upon a level or soda upon a fruition, then as you go along, two things are happening. You can fall into cessation sooner at two and a half hours, but I didn't see anybody do it on all those charts, the way I keep the charts of everybody. I didn't find any in six or seven retreats that did it in uh, very quickly, unless you keep practicing a lot, you know, over 
through your life and then you go, it might get smaller, smaller. Because the key here is being able to have a strong enough mindfulness that you can observe the nature of the moment you fall into cessation. That's the key. Are you alert enough after that happens? The problem with it is that when you go through, okay, then you come out and everything is changed and all everything is different around you with your sense doors changed vastly. And um, you get so enamored with that, it's hard to remember. What was that moment before you fell over into cessation? If you can tell your brain, teach your brain to identify that moment, then the time it takes for you to reach the point where you're going to tip over into cessation from neither perception or non-perception is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. You get, you see what I'm saying? Okay. So, but my charts from the people that I chart that I research and I keep track of, the charts that I'm keeping are showing me that people are not aware of that so much. So if they do it one, two, three, four times in a retreat sometimes, or three times in a retreat with three different levels of attainments, they're doing it at three hours and then maybe two and a half. It doesn't seem to go below two and a half hours to get there and do it again. You see? I think part of it is uh, you know, an eagerness to do it again. <laughs> Okay, that's part of it, isn't it? And that's going to shut it down and slow it down. Okay, I have to go for just one second. I will be right back, but there was a doorbell and I'm responsible to open the doors. So I'll be right back. Okay. Like, give me a half an hour. Okay. Could you could you close the door? Yeah. Okay. Um, dispassion. Dispassion really is. There's just. This is something that we try to talk to people about if they're going to be devoted to going all the way through to as far as they can go. Now, different people are set up different ways of being able to go into an attainment in this lifetime. And you might not be able to go any further than a certain level of attainments. That's possible. But when you get into anagami and what happens is uh, there really isn't any sex drive and this has disturbed some people talking to me about it, you know, and, and some people would like, you know, in, in relationships, it's a difficult thing, unless both people are working. All I can say to people is I was involved in something before I was involved in Buddhism for several years. And the, the main teacher in that tradition, uh, what we were working with, was very interested in maintaining uh, discharging hurts and letting things go out of your system and uh, coming to a very good stability mentally to handle almost anything. But um, he also looked into, uh, and some of the people involved in it looked into the natural needs of a human being. And in our societies today, in some societies, it isn't all societies, but in some cultures today, we've gone off the deep end with eroticism and accepted sex as an actual need for the survival of a human being. And it's not true. It's not true. You know, sex was put there for a co-creative uh, situation for the species. And it, but the thing about it is touch, human touch is a natural need for a human being. And everybody sort of went off the charts in agreeing touches, 
And, you know, it, so amongst the populations that are very supportive to each other and everything, holding someone when they're in, in deep distress and such, and they have no training, it's an untrained mind, you know, holding them, touching them, even putting your hand on them just to let them know that they are supported. Human touch is a lifesaver in heart conditions. The person who can go home from the heart attack and have loved ones there and have a supportive family and touch as part of this, rubbing their back, you know, things like that, they get better a lot quicker to have human touch in, in, the, in the person's life. But it doesn't have to be having to do with the sexual uh, practice. And this, this has happened, the loss of the golden years, I call it. It was left the loss of the golden years. I was in Miami for close to six or seven months at one point. And a young Chinese girl came up to Bonte and said, Bonte, can you explain something? And Bonte said, what? And she, he said, I was down in the main boulevard of Miami and I noticed something and I wondered if you could explain it to me because in our culture, this is not something we would see, but can you tell me why is it that so many men are driving little tiny sports cars with their daughters on the boulevard in Miami? <laughs> Well, Bunty didn't have an answer and he kind of shut down that conversation with her actually, but it was no real answer for this to happen, you know, because we, we didn't want to upset her, um, the naivete of not understanding that they, they had remarried young, very, very young people and they were running around in little sports cars. So it's an interesting phenomena, just remembering that, but, um, we're off the charts sort of in America with understanding perhaps what the golden years were and what having a best friend become the person that you have in a good marriage relationship and having marriage be solid. We have a very high rate of divorces and not staying together. And it's very sad, you see, and it causes a lot of suffering in people. But touch is very, touch can still be there in healing situations, in, um, in supporting people and that sort of thing. It can still be there. D dispassion is not a bad thing because it, it, uh, the, uh, to have a lot of active compassion in your life, uh, which is also encouraged in some societies, can be overwhelming and exhausting, not just to males, but to females too, males and females alike. The difficulty of when can I ever get any rest? Can we ever just hang out and be friends and that sort of thing? So the friend issue, and this comes from the marriage blessing that we put together one time uh, for people, that the marriage blessing was so important because of the, uh, the love of the friendship within the relationship, the respect for the person, the respect for space and allowing them to have private space as well as together space and to have a unified project, but individual development and the respect for that in the relationship is very important. But the communication and the way we communicate where we just listen to uh, the other person and we take turns so that when when they're listening, then they can listen to us. They can listen to us and we can listen to them. And we take turns doing that. It's really, really, really important. So this is the end of the, of the sutta where the important part of this is that this is what the blessed one said and the students were satisfied, delighted in the blessed one's words. And while the discourse was being spoken, while not clinging to, uh, not clinging through not clinging their minds, 60 students were liberated from the taints. 60 students. And it's a good example of listening to this. And then I've had some wonderful things happen. I, when I first learned this, I took it abroad and I was reciting it. And um, you know, wonderful things would happen for people. They were just so amazed at how they felt with it, how letting go, letting go, letting go of everything became so important. Okay, so in part four of this, I just told you that um, after about two weeks, 
twice a day uh, now or so that you, you can be ready to practice reciting the sutta while listening and following uh, a two-sided cue sheet. And I put together the cue sheet because I didn't want to lug around the sutta. And this, this cue sheet is kind of remarkable. The cue sheet is actually two sides of a page and it's written like this, you know, and the other side is like this and you can do it, make a two-sided page out of it. And it has the entire, once you practice the sutta a few times, when you look at this, this is enough for you to recite the sutta. It has all the pieces in there, but where the repetitions are, it, it sets it up so that you can easily follow this and you can listen to the recording a couple times with the cue sheet, and then you try it yourself and you can actually follow the cue sheet. It took a lot of work to get the cue sheet down to the size that I finally got it, but that was um, a real treat. So I wanna know if you have any questions about this, questions about the meaning of what was in the sutta if we, as we were going along. And so we, in the framework of it, the way it's all set up, it's easy to remember because of the repetition that's in it makes it actually short. It's only long because you have six sense doors, that's it. Okay, Ulysses, do you have a question? Yeah. I do have a question. Uh -huh. um, so um, one word that, that pops up in the, in the sutta that is interesting to me is the word disenchanted. And I just wanted to know if this disenchantment is sort of like no longer do the senses uh, operate to, you know, as a source of, for craving, you know, to nurture the craving once you are disenchanted with the disenchantment they're talking about you're disenchanted with with thinking because you've gotten to a place where you understand now this is all impersonal and you go enter into the disenchantment on the last section is what you're talking about um, when you start saying that you carry the dis carry the okay i'm not going to go in there again but the disenchantment what it really refers to is I, i'm disenchanted with going to the mall i'm disenchanted with going shopping i'm disenchanted with doing anything with acquisition outside of of just um continually working with my practice i become disenchanted because i see that this is true the anatta is true and when it starts to work and you're taking everything impersonally and you're not on the defensive anymore, then you just keep practicing this sutta. This is a wonderful example of doing, practicing a sutta and, and reaching sotapana or sakadagami, tripping over sotapana, sotapana fruition, sakagami, sakadagami fruition from just reciting the sutta. It'll throw it, the, and what we see happening, how does it affect the person when you apply disenchantment in your life, okay? Watch, watch where, like you would go to work, okay? Take the word enchantment. In order to be caught up in the craving, the lust, in the section where it's saying, uh, let's see. In the section where it's talking about the three kinds of feeling, you know, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neither painful nor pleasant. If you delight in it, welcome it and remain holding to it. But now you're disenchanted with that. You're disenchanted with getting delighted. You're disenchanted with welcoming it and holding on to it. See, the whole thing about the, um, the, the, the idea of the disenchantment, he takes you through every part of the sense door. That's true, all right, look at that again. Disenchanted with the um, well, entire parts of each one of the, um, of the sense doors. So if you're disenchanted with the eye, disenchanted with contact, so contact's not going to catch you. So you welcome it, get delighted in it, welcome it, and remain holding to it. Pull the different adjectives in the uh, active verbs, sorry, sorry, the verbs that are in there together and look at them on a piece of paper. 
Okay, and when you pull together the um, description of um, delighting in it, welcoming it, and remain holding to it, now you're not going to do that anymore. You become disenchanted with it because you see how it's pulling you into the craving and the clinging and the habitual tendency, the habitual reactions, okay? So once you decide you're disenchanted, you experiment. You see, you don't accept these things. You realize there's a difference in the feeling of being disenchanted for a whole entire day, disenchanted for being drawn into the wrong kind of conversation, the wrong kinds of jokes, the wrong kind of drinks, whatever, the disenchanted with uh, the forms, with the, um, the consciousness revolving around seeing something and getting addicted to wanting to see it again and again and again. This suit had a lot to do as an example with helping someone who was addicted to pornography and breaking free of it. Because when they started to examine how the habitual tendencies and addiction to the sights and sounds they were listening to, and then they decided to become disenchanted to see what it was like. And they started living that way and they started changing everything. And they started going out in their life and stopping uh, taking things personally at all and holding on to it and disenchanted and became dispassionate to that whole set of stuff. That's what the dispassion is out here. We can't take the tendency, for instance, in America with US students is to take the word passion and dispassionate, put it in a bottle and say, that's all it's about. But that's not true. You can be passionate about going to the mall <laughs> to the extent you quit school and you go to the mall and that's it. You can be passionate about music where you go overboard. And then look at the slippage in this when some group decides to tell a person like one of our students in England who was second chair cello in a symphony orchestra, she shouldn't play the cello anymore. It's not Buddhist. Do you see that as being slip, slippage? This is a woman who loved the cello more than anything in her life. And for people who play instruments that well, the instrument is a way for them to communicate like voices for you or when I was singing voice was for me. I'm a completely different person communicating through vocalese, you see? And you're a completely different person when you sit down, you start singing. I don't know how much you've worked with audiences, but to me, I wasn't there for the glorification of anything. You and I have talked about this. I was there performing or, or, or uh, you know, entertaining people to take them to another place away from suffering when I was performing, to put them in another, another experience other than the suffering they were feeling in the world, to give them an opportunity to experience something else. That was what was going on. I couldn't relate to someone accusing me of the other thing at all because it wasn't true at all in the least, you see? So disenchantment, you shouldn't stick it in a bottle maybe either and, what, and pertain it to only one thing. You see what I'm trying to say? It covers yeah, like, more, yeah. Like, like a lifting of the veil of the nature of what that thing is that is keeping you in there. So basically you understand the nature of what that is. And because you see that it's unwholesome, you don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. You That's know, right. You yeah. The, the, yeah, the expression in the Samyutta Nikaya was about, there was this word about um, careless and I can't remember what the other word was um, for, let's see, 1592. Um, Giving careless attention or giving attention. Giving attention or careless attention. Denourishment of the denourishment of the enlightenment factors is when you give careless attention to the hindrance. So every time, you know, there's some really bright people out there meditating, and if they could only hear this stuff, if you the message to those who are 
suffering from the dark night of the soul where the hindrances just come, 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 and there's no escape and they've been fighting them for six months. You can read about this on Buddhist sites sometimes. And here's the Buddha giving these direct messages out throughout the whole entire regime in Nikaya to just let them go, leave them alone, abandon them relinquish them, but they have to put in place of it, they have to have an object that is wholesome, that is helping them. And I think that might be part of the problem. I'm not sure. I don't get to, sometimes I get to work with them. <laughs> and then putting, that's why we like to take you from breathing into the Brahma Viharas. And it's the lesson of the two boys that went to become uh, working band they wanted to have a band for the summer and get gigs and make money in the summertime so they went to the music teacher and they said how much will it cost for me to learn to play the guitar and he said have you ever played before he said no sir he said about maybe i don't know three four hundred dollars and how long will it take before i can play in a band maybe one or two months and then he said how about my friend how long will it take him to play the bass effectively and he said, well, has he play? Oh yeah, he can do this and he can do that. And he's done all these riffs on his own, his own fingering, he's pretty good. And the guy went like this and he's calculating. He said, maybe thousand, fifteen hundred dollars maybe six months or more. He said, what's the difference? The difference is that he has a bunch of habits that have to be broken before I can teach him how to play the bass the right way. But you don't have anything in your head about, about the, the guitar and so if I start teaching you, you're just going to follow my instructions. You see the difference? And so that's, that's the thing, you see? So <laughs> it's just that way, yeah? It's the difference between careful, there you go, careful attention and careless attention. That's what it was. Careful attention the right way or careless attention, okay? Okay, now let's see. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, yeah, I have a question, sister. Okay, let's see. Yeah, uh, no, I. This is regarding the uh, uh, part of craving. You know, this is a set of six. The six, the sixth one uh, element is craving. Yeah. Uh, craving, yeah, craving, uh, as you taught us, uh, is the I like it or I don't like it mind. Right. And therefore, uh, I is already there. You know that in craving. So I am a little confused about uh, uh, here we are taught uh, uh, one regards craving, uh, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself, while actually craving the personal element is already into it. And the second part of my question is uh, in the section on underlying tendencies, again, uh, there is no reference to craving. It, it stops with feeling. The, the craving is not uh, part of that uh, uh, section on uh, underlying tendencies. It's, it, 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 you know, it just uh, uh, considers the first five, the eye contact, then uh, where, uh, the eye. Where, where are you? I'm sorry, I'm trying to follow it. Okay. Um, the the um, section 28, underlying tendencies. Section 28, okay. Okay, and but see, craving is the craving is the lust. That's the craving. See, they yeah, so my first, the yeah, I have two. What they did yeah, what? Have, listen, listen. They changed the terminology on you. They're now they are they are describing the craving here. When one is touched by a pleasant feeling, if one delights in it, welcomes it, and remains holding to it, the underlying tendency to lust lies within one. That's a complete description of craving. One who personally delights in it, personally welcomes it, and personally remains holding on to it, the underlying tendency to lust lies within one. They're defining lust by giving you the components of craving in that line. Got it? Okay. So what they so just that's, did, that's what it said. Yeah. yeah they, okay. The yeah, but then, uh, yeah, but then the paragraph just before that, section 27. Yeah. There, uh, uh, this is regarding the mind. There, yeah. uh, it says uh, the last uh, uh, line 
of that uh, yeah one regards mind craving thus this is not mine this i am not this is not myself yeah. the craving uh, as we already say is i like it or i don't like it mind so i i is already there inside craving that's the craving okay but he's saying he's showing you the way out of the craving so okay. he's saying this is not mine okay Rick, okay going to the board for a second if i can remember where i put my pencil <laughs> I, moved, I moved the furniture today that was an adventure okay i don't know what i did with that well okay i have to do it with my well i'll just explain it to you um hmm. frustration okay um i forget where you were going to go can you do it again the last part what you did yeah yeah, I'm saying uh, in our twin, we define uh, craving as uh, uh, the I like it or I don't like it mine. Right. So I, like I it. is only included in that uh, definition of uh, craving. Right. While here uh, in this sutta, it says uh, craving, uh, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. So, you know, this everywhere it's about craving it's that, the same that tension that it's okay first it says this is mine this i am this is myself the craving that's when you're stuck with it and when you're going to 28 it's saying you have to practice saying this is not mine this i am not this is not myself get it so the drill is to go walking around all day all the way to the craving to take i out of craving and see how it disappears to take the personal nature out and turn it into the impersonal nature, okay? Is that okay? Good. Thank you. I did it in less than a paragraph. <laughs> Aren't you happy I did it less than a paragraph? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's hard to do. I can see it better on the board and I have to find my pencil again. I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, so, Ulysses, did you have another question? No, okay. So I think the most interesting thing that we ever saw happen when Bonte gave this talk at Ruth Dennison's place was a, a longtime friend of his was there who just closed his eyes and listened intently to Bonte reciting this. And then at the end had tears in his eyes, had completely dissolved and left completely. And then he came up and very in a hushed voice, he said, there's nothing there. There's nothing there except consciousness. That's all that's left. And we said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's nothing there. So where does it leave us? That was an interesting thing. It leaves us in a position where we're in control, but the way that we end up being in control is because we gave up complete control of everything in order to see how everything worked. Once we saw how everything worked, the mind is set free and liberated from the knowledge and vision. So the knowledge, if it's clear enough, and this is where it gets really one of the slippage points is that when we go, you know, and we hear someone say, we're going to be teaching from the suttas, and then they teach in their own words without the sutta there, you see, then it, it throws us off if we're not familiar with doing that a lot. And we don't have the meat, uh, the pieces are not connected and they take one piece and we're and so we can never get to a place where we're ready to drive the car. We had the carburetor in our hand, gear system in our hand, transmission system in our hand. We went to shop. We tried to put the car together. It keeps falling apart because we're missing one piece. We can never get it to connect like this. So we can actually drive the car, see? And this helps us a lot because it cleans us out, cleans us out until we're empty and then we from there you look at it for and you tell me next time what you think when you ponder this 
when you are freeing yourself by practicing, what is really making you free? Without understanding mindfulness in the definition we're giving you, being able to be connected properly with uh, the meditation, mindfulness, and concentration, without redefining those to a, a level that makes it so that they really can, they're so almost conjoined meditation and mindfulness. Meditation can't be there without mindfulness. Mindfulness, it, it can't be there without meditation, without moving yourself to that place where the mindfulness is working uh, uh, incorrectly and reminding you, you're allowing the mindfulness to work. But the difference between mindful uh, meditation and mindfulness is very succinct. Meditation is observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how things work. That's a short one. Or in order to see clearly the four noble truths, dependent origination and the three characteristics. So they all come together. So you can, they fit together and make sense how it all works. And then the mindfulness is the observation itself, a skilled form of observation, which has certain talents of reminding you that when something comes and you move your attention over to it, what to do to stop that from happening, how to retrain the brain. And this is where the suttas I've been showing you lately, I look back and I said, well, I'm doing it. I mean, I'm showing you uh, number two, number two, number four, number 22. <laughs> There's a whole set of them. There's like nine or 10 of them. And when we did the foundation series last year, we touched these a lot, but they all have the same message. Do not engage the hindrance. The obstacle can only become an obstruction when you engage it, personally engage it. And then we showed you the Samyutta Nikaya, where if you take, if you're taking things personally, you're going to get involved with this the wrong way. But the Samyutta Nikaya was very clear in the explanation of how the hindrances are important in relationship to the arising or non-arising or the nourishment and denourishment of the enlightenment factors. For them to be able to come up and become in balance, we cannot go all the way through unless we get them in balance. And this is one of the ways to do it is to use the Chachaka Sutta. So this was one of the most helpful suttas that there is to memorize and it, I didn't do it yet, but if I took one piece of each section and put it on the pages, it'd probably only be four pages long. I you know it's not long. And then that's, that's why I wrote the cue sheet in the end, because then you can take that out and look at it and you can get through the whole entire sutta with the cue sheet because it's telling you how the one phrases then carry them over. So, um, Take your time in learning any of the memorization you do. Be real comfortable with it, but be disciplined about it and patient with your mind. Your, patient, your mind, understand it is like a child. It's still malleable like a child. And we didn't know this a num number of years back. And particularly, um, the sutta can give you a lot of encouragement because um, it supports everything else we're teaching you in the practice, okay? So I hope you have fun with it this week. If you wanna know more about the original list that he put together for the suttas for memorization, if you contact me at kantikema2 at gmail.com, then you, I have the list is in the file folder for revisiting this project, bringing it up again this year. And there's a whole, we made a list again of what's advisable by us, by the school. I mean, because I know somebody got online and uh, I think Mark talked about it, Mark um, Johnson, and it's very wise. If you really want to investigate memorization, there's other ways of doing this, certainly. But in the tradition that we're doing with the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, it's just that it's a good way for you to, to retrain yourself, to remember all the things that affect 
the practice itself by memorizing the pieces, the suttas that are supporting you again and again and again in the information we're teaching you about the practice so you can make it work, okay? So the um, once again, I don't know, you weren't here earlier, but on Sunday, um, there is another, I think it, we put it in the TWIM, on the TWIM page, we announced that on Sunday uh, in the Australian group, you go at 2.30, you can sit with them for an hour and then afterwards, we're, I'm going to go through the prophecies. And these are the prophecies and predictions that came out of the dreams of King Pasanadi. And so we'll do that. And anybody knows anybody in Malaysia that want to do that, they should come and listen to them because they used to like to listen to them before. They wanted to know about it. And I, I don't usually, I don't do them very often, but I'm not afraid of them, you know, but they're fun because when you, when you hear that this is almost like a Nostradamus type thing that exists in Buddhism and they have this 16 predictions that were the dreams of King Pasanadi and then his the interpretations the Buddha gave him. And we see a lot of that happening around us now. So we, this is rare what you're learning with us and it's a traditional form and I hope you keep doing it. And if you have any questions above all else, I hope you keep asking us questions, okay? All right, so I want you all to have a good week, okay? And I think we're time for our uh, closing here. Let's see. <laughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. And sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.